our favorite post painter, America's illustrator Norman Rockwell. As the nervous young artist tentatively opened the office door of the Saturday Evening Post, he hoped he might also open a door to his dream, that dream of one day seeing one of his paintings on the weekly magazine's cover could either be realized or crushed in the next few minutes. That uncertainty worked at his nerves as he desperately summoned every ounce of courage. After all, not only was he unsure if his work would be accepted, he didn't know if anyone would even see him. Having veered from his usual fastidious planning, he hadn't made an appointment. Yet there he stood in Philadelphia, in March of 1916, holding the doorknob to his possible future. Years later, the world-renowned Norman Rockwell remembered that he almost turned around and headed back to New York when he reached the Post's office building. Somehow, he managed to work up his nerve and enter. The magazine's editor, George Horace Lorimer, wasn't able to see him, but the art editor came out front. As he studied the paintings, time nearly stopped for the 22-year-old Rockwell. Anxiously searching the editor's face for a clue, he finally saw the smile he was hoping for. Although it had been a nerve-wracking experience, it wasn't as if Rockwell had walked into the studio alone. He was accompanied by a pouting young boy in a dapper little derby begrudgingly pushing a baby stroller as two boys in baseball uniforms smirked at him. A backyard circus barker in a top hat had also joined the nervous artist. A youthful promoter excitedly exhibited a young strong man cloaked in a fresh set of long johns with liberally padded bulging biceps. The two paintings these characters inhabited were both accepted for future covers. Not only that, the editor tentatively accepted the three other planning sketches Norman displayed. Despite the lack of an appointment, the door to his dream had swung wide open. The birth of that dream reached back to his New York City childhood, where he had learned the basics of sketching from his father. The two of them would often spend evenings copying scenes from weekly magazines. His father had no ambitions in art, but enjoyed drawing. Like Norman, his skills apparently came from his father. Norman's grandfather had immigrated to America from England and was once described as a painter of portraits and landscapes by preference, occasionally a house painter by necessity. Young Norman was captivated by several of his paintings and especially loved his attention to detail. Rockwell's artistic skills were a saving grace in his school and neighborhood social circles. Unlike his handsome, athletic older brother, the skinny, less than impressive looking Norman managed to supplement his limited social skills by drawing pictures for other children. Still, he was basically introverted, and spent a lot of his time quietly drawing. Fortunately, his family often spent several summer weeks in the country. Those lazy summer days in nature, as he reflected, altogether formed an image of sheer blissfulness. Many of his later paintings would reflect this peaceful setting. The first major step in the career that would produce these peaceful and blissful paintings came at the age of 14 when he began taking some classes at New York City's Chase School of Art. Halfway through his sophomore year, he quit high school and signed up full-time at Chase. Later, he studied at the National Academy of Design and finally at the Art Students League. Incidentally, during his first class using a nude model, his class was crowded and he could see only her feet and her rear end, so that's all he painted. One of his biographers later noted Rockwell literally started his career in figure drawing from the bottom up. His first professional breakthrough came at 18 in the Art Students League, 
One of his teachers, Tom Fogarty, sent him to a publisher where Norman was commissioned to illustrate a children's nature book. The next year, he became a staff artist for Boy's Life magazine and later served as their art director. His link to the Saturday Evening Post materialized when he shared a studio with a cartoonist named Clyde Forsyth. Norman's new studio mate had previously sold cartoons to the Post and encouraged him to try his luck there as a cover illustrator. That suggestion would lead to an eventual collection of over 320 Saturday Evening Post covers. Although the first two covers were accepted as is, his third, Gramps at the Plate, didn't quite suit the editor. Mr. Lorimer told Norman that the old man looked too rough and tramp-like. After a repaint of the old fellow, Rockwell headed back to the office. This time, Lorimer said the man looked too old. Once again, Rockwell dutifully repainted the character. Upon his return, he was told the boy looked too small. This continued for two more edits, as Norman smiled through his growing disappointment and frustration. Later, Lorimer disclosed that this had actually been a test he gave his artists to determine their ability to work with criticism. Once Rockwell had passed the test, his steady stream of cover illustrations graced the magazine with salt of the earth people the country could identify with. His pictures generated millions of smiles and helped the Post become the magazine America read. Subscriptions zoomed as his salt-of-the-earth characters acted out his colorful imagination. Neighbors transformed into nationally recognized characters. Like a movie director, Norman would carefully pose his models in scenes, take pictures, grab a brush, and begin to work his magic. Several of his models showed up throughout the years in various scenes. One of these was James K. Von Brunt. With his ponderous nose and, as one writer observed, a face only a mother and Norman Rockwell could love, was becoming recognizable. I think you're using that man too much, George Lorimer told Rockwell. In addition to his less-than-gorgeous mug, Von Brunt's huge bushy mustache was also easy to identify. Norman told him that he would have to shave off his mustache in order to continue as his model. Von Brunt declined and dejectedly left the studio. Two weeks later, he reappeared and said he would do it for an additional $10. Norman paid him and later noted, I guess the notoriety he'd gained from posing for me had overcome his pride in his mustache. As the decades passed, Rockwell's genius would give birth to a string of iconic illustrations that captured not only the whimsical nature of the country, but often touched deeper shared emotions. His depiction of the four essential freedoms that President Franklin Roosevelt had set out in his 1941 address to Congress would tour the nation and help the government sell $130 million of war bonds. The 1964 Look magazine cover, depicting a young black girl walking behind two federal marshals past a wall defaced with racial graffiti, stirred our collective conscience. And his 1969 painting of Neil Armstrong's left foot imprint in the lunar soil roused our national pride. These serious topics helped to stifle some art critics' complaints that he was not an artist, but an illustrator. Although they intended their critique to deflate Rockwell's self-image, the truth was he had always considered himself to be an illustrator. Addressing the light-hearted nature of most of his work, he simply explained, I paint life as I would like it to be. As his legend blossomed, it became apparent that was also the way his millions of fans would like it to be. <laughs>